Right on. Uh, are we are we live? Are we? Uh, can we tweet out that we're live? Yes, you can. You can. Cool. you can tweet all you want. I was tweeting from the urinal earlier. So how many people actually saw the show right before this? Thanks for coming. Look, uh, you know, I'm not sure if that's good or bad. There's like 1,100 people in the show, and 18 came over here. So the others are like, no, don't waste your time. Yeah. <laughs> that was pathetic. Yeah, no, hey, thanks for coming out. You guys are awesome. Thanks for coming to the show. Uh, some of you might have tried to come to the show and couldn't get in. They turned away as many people uh, as actually went to the show. So that was pretty cool. Uh, I appreciate that. This is, I've been waiting for this as much as the other one, because this guy right here, Brian Brushwood, is a good friend of mine. Um, we've, we've eaten dinner all over the country together. We've <laughs> put that on our tombstone. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, Brian's actually had me, uh, he put me up in his house before I was doing a show in Austin and he said, dude, just stay at my house and we'll hang out. And, um, he learns that when I come over, he doesn't get any sleep, but that's okay. I'm sorry. I'm tweeting. <laughs> okay. I, 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 slash live or skeptrack.org slash. Uh, no, there's a link on the top. All right, whatever. There, tweet. Video yeah, video. Ah, too late. I already track. tweeted. Wow, you see, the the voice God is slow. How many of you guys know Brian Brushwood already? Yeah, there you go. You should follow him. Uh, hey, real quick. Um, uh, I uh, not not online. Just follow him. It's really creepy. I love it. <laughs> what? Um, uh, I I uh, what, what, what what is this panel? About Question YouTube. and answers, magic, All right. uh, do, do, skepticism. Do, do we need to explain? Uh, here, I'll tell you what. I, I will talk about you when you can talk about me. Uh, hey, guys. Uh, I, I'm out oh, of here. This is just like when you're not around. <laughs> no, no, that's fine. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, Kurt Anderson first got on my radar uh, four years ago. A friend of ours, a mutual friend named Dennis Rogers, who is pound for pound the world's strongest man. I'm sure you talked about it in the stage yep. show. Uh, uh, he was a former world champion arm wrestler. I originally toured with him like 14 years ago uh, with, with uh, Rascal Flatts. Uh, Brian was 12. Crazy. At the time, yeah, <laughs> and uh, uh, yeah, he did strongman feats. He, he he taught me how to tear a deck of cards. He taught me how to drive a nail through a board with my bare hands. Uh, and and he showed me a bunch of uh, other amazing feats. And he called me saying, uh, "I just did this event. Uh, there's a guy that you need to connect with. His name's Kurt Anderson. He's out of uh, Alabama. If your uh, tour ever takes you near the area, it's it's you absolutely have to connect with him. He's a really cool guy. And it turns out that uh, or he's like, just give him a call. So I get I get on the phone." And, uh, and, and, and Kurt's like, hey, man, I was at your show. And I immediately think, like, ah, shit, I'm spy. I should have re remembered. Uh, like, I, like I, I could remember everyone's name. Uh, but apparently you had seen me at Dragon Con, but, uh, but we started talking. Later, Kurt starts to contribute some of the best suggestions for Scam School that we've ever gotten, some of the best effects. And uh, uh, we began a mutual admiration society. And then we fought crime for 20 years. That's right. <clears throat> well, time's different over in our part of the country. <laughs> yeah. We remember things differently. We can do that. So, uh, Brian is one of the most uh, famous and influential magicians on the web. Brian, Brian's very techie. Brian does a lot more than just uh, magic. Uh, one of the most talented and most intelligent people that I know. And uh, he seems like a just out of control frat guy that never grew up. And there's a part of him that, that is that way. Uh, but behind all that is a guy that just really knows his stuff. Uh, he's, he's an incredible person beyond, you could take away everything he does right now and he'd be successful in, you know, a couple more years because he's that kind of guy. And at, at heart, he's one of the nicest people that I know. So the fact that uh, he took the time to, to get to know me in, in the, like this guy works 18 hours a day. And he took a few minutes to get to know me and, and be my right, blah, 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 who cares? So, Questions. There uh, uh, and by the way, uh, Andy's humble. Uh, <laughs> uh, the uh, uh, as I understand, and I keep in mind, I, I am a sleep de deprived whirlwind uh, coming in from LA, leaving in in twelve hours. Uh, but as I understand it, it seems like there is an incredible cross section between skepticism and the magic community. And of course, we owe all of that to the fabulous James Randi and all of the fantastic work he's done. That's he's not here, guys. Um, uh, sorry, <laughs> uh, but the, uh, the, uh, 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 and to me, it's a curious cross section. And I, I assume that the purpose of this Q and a is to, uh, I don't know, ask thought provoking questions about that intersection or about the two of us individually or, 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 uh, wh why are we here? Kind of anything except how did you do the yeah, just such trick, right? I'll, I'll give you now, if you want to learn some magic, catch out, uh, scamschool.com. You can learn a lot of stuff there. 
but we're not going to reveal how magic's done here. We we we'll talk. We can talk about the principles behind it. What I'm makes totally it work? It's, it's a weird it's, thing that we do. Like we have a, magic it's, conventions. It's, it's a fake thumb and uh, when and it, strings uh, and yes. mirrors. Uh, oh, no, in all seriousness, whoever has questions, just come on up. Uh, yeah. No, no, no formal. There's anything. a mic right Let's just there. Get started. The mic is right there. And uh, whoever stands in front of that mic, it is an enchanted mic that will make you taller and more handsome to all of us. Oh, now they there move. You go. Two guys at the same time, you should fight over this. That's good. Uh, uh, that was a weak fight. Um, hey, buddy, what's your name? Uh, my name's Marlon. Marlon, where are you from? Uh, Columbus, Georgia. Yeah. Uh, from Georgia, right on. What can we yeah, do for excellent. you? Um, I was just wondering, when you're doing psych profiles for people, you have to do it right on the spot, right? Um... The actual practice and talent and um, having to know a wide variety of people and what they do and say to, how long does that take to be it, you able know, to it's do kind it of right weird. The, the, the thing with that in the show, some of it's real, some of it's not. You know, like I do, I do escapes, um, but I don't promote myself as an escape artist because there are like unlike the strength feats. Now he mentioned Dennis Rogers, our friend. Dennis said, "Look, if you're going to commit to do the strength feats, there's ways to cheat in all of these. I won't accept that. If you're going to, if I'm going to train you, you have to legitimately do this. Like if you look at the frying pan that I rolled up in the show, you're not going to be able to unroll it. That's a legit frying pan. It's not like one of these thin aluminum frying pans. It's the real thing. But um, I don't promote myself as um, like a psychic or a real escape artist because there are times where I do legit stuff and there's time that I that I cheat." Okay, yeah. um, but I present them the same because I don't feel like my job is to fool anybody, but to entertain you. So if you walk away and you go, wait a second, that takes forever to do that. Um, now I know that I've done my job because you're not sure if it's real or not. Well, That's it, part but, of what I'm trying to do. Man, so it, is, it does take a lot of work either way, but some of the things that we do would take more time than a person could live to actually do if you're going to do it for real. Uh, so it is so awesome to hear someone else in the same position because when I first uh, started my stage show, um, it was it – was, uh, there were some people who were like, no, it's a bad idea. You're doing this sideshow stuff, but then you're also doing this mind-reading stuff. Everything's got to be either totally real or totally fake or whatever. Uh, but to me, there's delight in the mushy middle in yeah. not knowing between one side or the other. You know, obviously, when, when – um, uh, because – my favorite moment in, in the stage show is, you know, I come out and I eat fire, which is a real, uh, I don't know, thing, like it's actual flames in the mouth or whatever. But then but then people are expecting a magic show. So you do the human blockhead, hammer a whole four and a half inch nail in the nose. And pe some people, they're like, well, that's clearly real too because the sinus passages. And other people are already tuned out. They're like, well, that's magic. Uh, and then and then, it, then you get into, uh, uh, you, know, you know, mind reading and, 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 and personality reading. And there's this spectrum between the 100% real and the 100% fake. And to me... There's wonder in the agony of not knowing which right. is which, and the in the self reflection of there. Uh, and and uh, uh, I'm glad to hear that I'm not the only one who feels that. So way. Let, let me ask you this, related to what he's saying. Like I do this. If you saw the show, I do mind reading things, and um, some things I pick up from people. Some things I cheat to know. But have you ever you ever been doing a reading on somebody, and you you get a piece of information? There really is no way you could know, but you just like in your head you know. I, I had that one time. I was but doing the, this thing. You, you know what it is? Is there okay? When you do, I ain't seen your act, uh, but <laughs> he says yeah, we're to, real close, to aren't his we? friends. <laughs> but, but, but oftentimes what will happen is there are certain beats that you know you have to hit, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and you will figure out things, you know, I don't know, uh, far, far before, and you're getting from X to Y to Z. But along the way, you have wiggle room. And there will be, there will be moments where you're like, uh, you, you'll take an educated guess, and you can afford to maybe... Take right. a complete miss, right. and then and then after the fact, say say like uh, it, it, in in a good reading, there will be some definite misses, which will only right. make the whole thing as a package look better. Right. So oftentimes you'll take a risk, and if it's a miss, you're like, well, good, that's the wabi sabi that'll make this look like a good reading. But other times you will be wildly lucky and exactly nail that moment. In which case you're like, yeah, bro, that's that's what I do. I, I had a, I, right. I had a guy draw something one time. And I was able to figure out what it was he drew. And in my head, like, I knew for some reason that this was a tattoo that he was going to get but hadn't, didn't get yet. <laughs> and so I said, you've thought about having this as a tattoo. And the guy's draw just dropped open. So part of it is the more you do it, the more real it seems because you get better at it. Okay. it this it, is something that does take years of practice. But it's just like uh, any, any time I teach my students, I say there's a difference in knowing how a trick is done and being able to do it. I could show someone how to do a trick, and they might or might not have the skill to do it, 
but the bigger gap is being able to do it and being able to perform it. Well, and, and real quick, just, just to uh, wrap everything on a skeptical bow, um, there are some performers who, who make their bones, um, they, they, they make their bones saying that they have actual psychic powers, assholes, uh, and, uh, but, and they use tricks to get there, uh, but they honestly believe, they're like, well, you know, I feel like sometimes I could do it without the secret gimmick or whatever. And they can tell themselves that because we all like to remain consistent and believe that we have a consistent set of ethics, but uh, that's a very easy, slippery slope to, to fall down into. Um, and it makes me glad to see that there's more people like Kurt Anderson who will flatly, like while you're on stage, it's all fair game. We're putting on a play, I'll look you in the face, tell you a story about how I was 14 years old and played with a knife and spun some cups around and slammed my hands down. It's all a total lie. To me, the difference uh, ethically is when the show's over, you're like, well, what was it like uh, when you uh, were spinning those cups when you were 14? I'm going to look you in the eye and be like, no, man, this is a freaking show. So it's like uh, uh, the show's over and, uh, and, and, and your question's done, sir. Yeah. Applaud for this man. <laughs> What's up, boss? So I'm an actuary, so a calculator just without personality. Name it where you're from. Oh, Terry, that- Philadelphia. Wait, what? Say again? My name is Terry. I'm from Philadelphia. Excellent. Right on. Terry from Philadelphia. All right. Um, are, you, are you applauding for the Terry part or the Philadelphia part? The actuary, the actuary part. part. <laughs> My people. Yeah, yeah go actuaries and such. Um, so, <laughs> um, yeah, we're like, we're like the superheroes. I don't know. Um, so I, I will see a, a article in Popular News that misuses what I consider the tools of my trade, um, statistical sampling and other things like that. And um, I, I spend a lot of time correcting people about that. But there is no mystique to the work of the actuary. Sometimes we can convince people we have powers over life and death, but most people realize we're just number jockeys. Um, is it any different as a magician? Like, you see the tools of your trade. I, I think in a lot of cases you probably have a visceral moral reaction that this is an improper use of these tools. But as magicians, you seem to have another rule set that says those are also tools that we can't necessarily betray to the public. Do you have that same outrage? Uh, uh, no. Uh, okay, uh, as, far as, as far as, like, seeing stuff represented in mass media. And by the way, if you have a question, get in line now so that we don't have a weird, awkward gap where I'm crying for you guys to come up. Um, okay. Uh, the author, Michael Crichton, talked about uh, what he called the Murray Gelman effect. Uh, Murray Gelman, and I'm probably misremembering all of this, but uh, uh, he was a physicist, is that right? Yep. Okay, good. Famous physicist, and he talks about how every time he opens the newspaper and he sees some story related to physics, he's like, well, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong, and that's wrong. Oh, well, this is definitely happening in the Middle East now. There's this weird disconnect that we have. When it's our field of expertise, it's very easy to call out the obvious flaws in, in uh, uh, journalism, but, uh, but we suddenly turn around and accept it. Uh, in the entire history of my performing, and I mean this all the way from, uh, I don't know, the Des Moines local newspaper to CNN, not one news institution has factually reported 100% of, of, of my show. Let me say that again. From the local newspaper to CNN, not one has given a 100% factual accounting of the stage show that I did. Even CNN saw that I was voted Variety Entertainer of the Year on college campuses, which they reported as Variety Magazine named him Entertainer of the Year on college campuses. Zero percent track record on on journalism, and I I suspect it's a case where, uh, in your case, it's actuarial studies, in our case, it's magic or whatever. Um, uh, It's easy for us to see what's obviously wrong in our own field, but that's it, which I don't think is exactly what you asked, but I wanted to say that. Go. Uh, (laughs) So there's, there's people that do, they make up their own judgments instead of rules for themselves in every field. It's just that ours is more bizarre than others. So there are people who say, oh, well, like you said, I can use this trick and I get people to think that I'm reading their mind. Next thing they know, well, hey, I could actually put a red palm out in front of my house and I don't have to go to work anymore. Um, Well, you know, but but as far as like stage magicians, everybody kind of pretty much is there's 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 it's this. That's a big question in a sense, because like some people will steal other people's material. Okay. Yeah. Like we both do straight jackets, which we stole okay. from Houdini. Suck it, Houdini. <laughs> right. <laughs> but he's not around, so he can't say anything. But I don't do Brian's routine, and he doesn't do mine. 
But it's not that we do it out of any black and white, hard and fast rules. Right. It's it's because there's a sense that you're taking away from someone else. And part of it is an ethical thing. Part of it is, a, well, this is someone else's. But for example, uh, on Scam School, um, uh, there's, a, there's a, a video that I'm very proud of that took me uh, about an hour to record and about uh, six years of thinking in order to get to called uh, On the Ethics of Teaching Magic on YouTube. Because there is, a, there is a contingency of magicians out there who feel like all magic must be charged for. If you are not charging for magic, you are exposing it for free. To which I say, how did you learn magic? Like, oh, me? Well, I went to the library where I learned it for free. And the entire point of the video is, guess what? YouTube is a library. It is the greatest library in the history of mankind. If you can get a PhD on Khan Academy from the information that the, is there on YouTube, it is a meritocracy where the more you want to know, the more you can dive in of your own accord. It is not a place where you buy the secret to get to the front of the line. It is the purest form. Now, having said that, there are people who post other people's material on YouTube. There are people who go to Theory 11, they will buy a $50 presentation and turn around, open the box, and show off the gimmick for free on their own channel. Again, this is not, uh, you know, by what standards is this unethical? It's unethical because it damages the art of magic. It reduces the art. It damages the, the most valuable resource that mag magic has, which is uh, magic uh, creators, you know, the people who are building up our, our entire art. And so in that regard, it's immoral. Uh, not so much that there's any kind of, you know, you can write whatever code of conduct you want for those things. But, uh, but as a result, like on Scam School, the questions we ask are, number one, uh, uh, is, uh, uh, for, uh, what, watch the video, it's amazing, there's that. Clap for this guy! Uh, hey buddy, what's your name? I'm David, I'm from around here. Right on! <laughs> he lives um, in the hotel. <laughs> Just walks no, around. the room. That's okay. In this room, yes. <laughs> Sleeps under the stage. <laughs> Go uh, ahead. You said right at the beginning that, um, uh, the association with between skepticism and magic was largely by James Randi, uh, which is just recently, because if you go back to the beginning, like one of the earliest books we have with magic tricks in it is The Discovery of Witchcraft. That's right. So it seems like there's more of a um, the type of person connection between the person that's interested in magic and the person that's interested in the skepticism ideas. And so what is it in... A cer that certain type of person, why do those things seem to go together so Actually, well? Actually, that's a really good point. I just yeah. got served. Uh, uh, yeah, go, I mean, and, and not just that, you know, going back to Houdini or whatever, it, it's, I, I, I have a theory about this, but I want you to... I, I, I think it's the way our brains process, like the way we look at the world, the way that we come up with things. Um, you know, when we create tricks or illusions and things like that, or we see it, we, we try to think about how does that work and then how could it not work? And let's make it look like it works that way. And, and so you just process the information. You learn to think about things from different points of view. Um, and I try to look at it from how is this going to look from the audience's point of view? And is this going to be entertaining? Is it going to be funny? Is it going to be wow factor? Whatever. And so when you think like that in, in every aspect, I find that thinking bleeds over to everything that I do. I, I have a theory. Where's our actuary? What was your name again? Terry, t uh, wa uh, uh, walk me through, actually, w walk up to the mic here real quick, because uh, I want to ask this. Um, uh, 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 standard deviation, uh, is there like a particular percentage that means a certain thing on that? Like, uh, uh, here's where I'm going with this, okay? What, what, if, what if it's not that magicians are uh, naturally honest skeptics or whatever, but what if instead, as a percentage, um, is it possible that magic as an industry is really just a standard deviation of scoundrels in general, <laughs> but this edge that has this perverse desire to be just honest enough to admit all this is a trick. I mean, is, is that something we see in, in uh, the bell curve in general? Sure, well, there you're talking about, you're talking about two axes. So you, you've outlined a, a, I love this. a misdirection. <laughs> you, you've outlined a misdirection axis. Okay. And then say on top of that, there's a morality axis. An honesty axis. Yeah, yeah and yeah. you're saying that magicians occupy this corner. And skeptics are also in the, um, in the honesty corner, they just lack the misdirection ability. Right. So you could say that you have two phenomena that are correlated that have a common causal driver between the two. There's a lot of things that you run into um, trying to think of an actual. Give this man a though. standing ovation. <laughs> I'm not. 
I don't even know what he said. Yeah. I'm sure he's right, though. That was amazing. I'm On sitting here thinking, the though, I can make a quarter of actuaries, Thank you for making the mer me the first actuary in human history to get a standing ovation. <laughs> yeah! Um, Terry! <laughs> Give it, no, seriously, let's do this. Let's Thank you, man. <clears throat> All right, get off the Can mic. Can I go in my hole now? Thank right. you. <laughs> I hope we answered your question. <laughs> so I think either way, your theory or, or mine, it's just we're a bunch of weirdos. Uh, yeah. Right? That's, either I way. I something. <laughs> What's your name, sir? My name is Jordan. I'm from Charleston, South Carolina. Excellent. Hey, Jordan. Hey. I was in South Carolina performing last week. Beautiful place. Go ahead. Thank What's you. your question? Um, as a fellow magician. Excellent. Um, thank you. Um, I have always wondered, uh, you know, I went to a completely Afri African-American uh, high school. Okay. And so I was just wondering audiences if... audiences for your magic. Yeah. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I have had some of the best reactions I've ever had there. Um, with that said, have you guys ever noticed a difference in terms of reaction when it comes to uh, racial standing? Econo uh, economic standing, social class, and ethnicity. Uh, yeah, I, this is, man, talk about a touchy subject. Uh, it's, it's difficult because... First, first of all, can we be real honest? Like, No. Oh, yes. You know, okay? Oh, please. Oh, please. Like, and I'm going to let you do the big answer to this, but it, it does sound, it, to a lot of people, it sounds racist, but it's not. It's true. African-American crowds are... White people are, are better than black people. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds racist. <laughs> But here is how, no, I'm sorry. Afri Afri African American crowds in general show um, immediate response more than white crowds. And that's good or bad. Like, if you suck, they will let you know, right? Yep. So I've been told. Have you ever watched Maury? But, um, you know, that's not, that's not always the case. And a lot of times, inner city schools um, with all different types of nationalities and stuff, it's tougher to get them started. But once they get started, they're a better crowd. Well, okay, first of all. But Dragon Count crowds are always awesome. Oh. <laughs> cheap pop, cheap pop. Uh, it's true, though. No, okay, right. Uh, it's so weird, man, because, um, uh, and keep in mind, I'm talking about, I, I have no idea, I don't know nothing. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but, but I will say that uh, as a magician, there are certain things that you look for, right? Uh, now, keep in mind, the reality of what you get always immediately overrides whatever... Uh, 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 I don't know. Correlate, correlation is not causation, right? Um, uh, uh, if you have uh, if, if you have a large African American audience and they tend to react very big, that is correlated with the color of their skin. That is not because of the color of their right. skin and so on, right? And so likewise, when uh, when I do, some of you guys have seen the drawing duplication routine I do called simpatico. I always look for uh, a a taller man sitting next to a woman who's hopefully clearly a couple because the thinking is this is a taller person who's probably more confident in himself he's probably not going to worry about being made fun of he's probably accustomed to uh, uh to rolling with it uh and he's next to a woman which means he's probably in a relationship it means he probably is confident and uh and will again be willing to follow instructions and, pay al and play along <laughs> um I also look for somebody who's going to look me directly, directly in the eyes because it shows that he's engaged and he's not implicitly showing that he's not willing to play along. Uh, and, then, and now having done that, having said that, I make sure to get two of those guys and in the short distance from the back of the auditorium up to the front, I have the opportunity to see who was faster to get out of his seat, uh, who, who was more willing to play along, uh, uh, who was excited, and who had the bigger reaction around him because the one who had the bigger reaction, I want to give him the more impressive job so that he'll get the bigger uh, uh, one of them I put a box over his head and it's kind of funny so like that's the guy who I want you know to have his section of the audience do that all of that is all me being absolutely prejudicial based entirely on appearances however even when you do all of that sometimes you get up and the guy just draws the wrong ass picture right uh, so again you know the reality overrides everything um, uh, having said all of that uh, if, if, if you pinned me down after seven beers and maybe describe what different uh, 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 racial audiences reacted to different ways, I mean, we might have a fun conversation, <laughs> but obviously I don't think it would be a very productive one. Uh, and so uh, having said all that, it's weird because simultaneously 
when you're doing a cold reading, race does matter because it is an indicator of, of ethnic background uh, upon which you can draw some possible information. But again, all of that is correlated and certainly not causated. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. And it's not always accurate either. I've had, I've had you know, white crowds that were more responsive to black crowds, Asian crowds that are more responsive, less responsive. It's, it's Shots fired, Asians. <laughs> See if we can offend anyone else. All right, clap for this man for crossing racial boundaries. How are you? I'm well, thanks. How are you? Great. Good. What's your name? I'm Shana. I'm from New York. Shana from New York. What, what can we do for you? Um, okay, you mentioned Houdini earlier. and you also Never heard of him. <laughs> and you also said earlier that what distinguishes you from, say, a con artist is that after the performance, if someone asks you, you know, how did you do that? You tell them straight up, no, it was a trick, it was a performance. Do you ever encounter people who just don't want to hear that? They want to believe that you guys have magic powers, and what yeah. okay. do you do in that case? Well, well, first of all, Brian tells them straight up, it was just a trick, that was just a story. No, I, I, do I, actually, sometimes. I actually don't. I okay. actually don't. There's, uh, okay, I, I, I don't mean, either. Well, well there, there's, a, there's a category of my show that I will say, uh, any, anytime it's a mind reading thing, someone says, uh, wow, when did you discover you had this gift? I'm like, uh, no, it ain't right, a gift. Right, right. Uh, there's another category of stuff. The, the fire eating and the human blockhead are obviously standard sideshow stunts that took a lot of years of training to do. So they'll be like, uh, so did you just like slide a hand that nail? I'm like, no, I'll do it again for you. It's definitely going up my nose. Then there's a third category in the middle where I honestly feel like to give them a direct answer either way will be taking something away from them, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So instead what I'll do, I don't want to disrespect them as a human being, uh, 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 somebody will ask and I'll say, you know what, uh, a lot of people ask that, some people have gotten in arguments about how, whether it's real or not, I will tell you flat out that you can find the answer, it's in the library, it's in uh, the autobiography of Robert Houdin, written in 1861, and uh, 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 just go to the library and look. And they won't, because right. deep down they want the mystery. You know, it's, it's that, uh, it's that um, nowadays the answer to every magic trick you saw today, every magic trick in my show, is in your pockets. So if you can't be bothered to get the answer out of your freaking pocket, don't come asking me. <laughs> So, well, I'm, I'm going to tell a story that, that le uh, you can talk to people till you're blue in the face and tell them that it's not real, and they just, some people just don't get it, okay? And that's back to why we have skepticism and critical thinking. Learn to think for yourself. But this, I, I've had several times people come to me, I, you know, I live in Alabama, live in the South, and I, I do a lot of shows in rural areas all across the nation. And occasionally I'll get somebody come up and they'll say, well, hey, we're not going to have you come to our community, our schools, or whatever, because there's people who think what you do is satanic or demonic or whatever. And as weird as that sounds, it still happens occasionally. My favorite story, because usually I'll say, well, look, if what I do is wrong, whoever has a problem with it, let me talk to them face to face. And if what I'm doing I'll is wrong... I'll kick their ass. <laughs> that's, what, that's my wife's job right there. <laughs> no, but I say, look, if, if what I do is demonic and it's wrong, it's not that I shouldn't do it for your school. I shouldn't do it for any school. But if I can explain what I do and it's okay, then I should be able to, we should be able to talk about it. Uh, I've been doing magic since the mid-70s, and I've only had one, ever, one person ever say, okay, I'll talk about it. Most people don't want to talk about it. They don't want to learn something. But I had one case, and this is really cool, it's South Dakota. It's in the middle of nowhere, South Dakota. And uh, we're doing a community show, and we find out one of the guys that's on the board says, this is demonic, we can't do this. And I'm already there. I mean, I said, well, here's the thing. By contract, you have to pay me anyways because I've already paid for my flights, hotel, the whole deal. But the bigger thing is your community is not going to get a chance to see something like this again. I really want to do the show. So I said, would the, would the gentleman talk to me face to face? And they talked to him, and he agreed to it. Only time it's ever happened. So I explained to him what I do is not real. We go through all this stuff. He asks all the questions. And at the end, he goes, you know what? I'm, I'm just not comfortable with it because I don't understand it. I said, well, let me, let me tell you something that happened last night. I'm, I'm in my hotel room by myself in Rapid City, and I was just kind of thinking about the show, I was kind of meditating on some things, and I, and I opened my eyes, and I could see this man in the room with me. I could see him just as though he was really there. I could hear every word he spoke, but I'm convinced he was not in my room. Last night, I believed the man was in New York City. I said, you think that's demonic? He said, yes. I said, Alabama, we call it television. <laughs> <laughs> I said, just because I don't understand something doesn't make it demonic. I don't know how TV works. 
right? But I don't believe it's demonic. To me, it's more impressive that people bought TVs before they had radio TV stations. Like, yeah. that's, the, that's the hard sell. Yeah, I ain't even going to try to top that. And so, <laughs> so he agreed to let me do the show, and in the end, I, I set it up. I said, hey, what I do is not real. If you saw the show today, what I do is not real. If you see how it works, it's not magical. Um, and hopefully, if I do things right, you won't see how everything works. But some people, you can tell that to them all day long, and they're just, they've got it in their head, part of it's real, and you can't change their mind. Uh, yeah, Great in, question, though. In fact, uh, yeah, uh, whatever. To, to me, yes, there we go, that's it. I, I just realized I was going to talk about, like, all skepticism in general. Screw that. Hi, how are you? Hi. What's um, your name? Lena, and I'm from Atlanta. Yep. Right on. Oh, yeah. Hot Atlanta. Um, so, one of the most successful, uh, I guess, aspects of a successful musician, or musician, ma magician, is um, chariz charisma. So how much do you think that plays into the career of, of a magician? And do you think that there's any magicians that kind of ride on their charisma more than their actual talent? Yes, I do. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Uh, in fact, actually, it's, it's, it's wild because there are magicians who are extraordinarily talented. Magic is a weird environment where the most talented people aren't necessarily the ones best known as magicians. Oftentimes, you'll have doctors and lawyers and investment bankers and people who are independently wealthy who are in a position where they could just think and puzzle and, uh, and, and put together these incredibly crafted routines but have, have no interest in actually performing themselves. You know, there are magic technicians. Uh, and then separately, you have people who... Uh, are naturally gifted and funny and hilarious. In fact, I recommend all of you guys read Steve Martin's biography, Born Standing Up, where he talks about, you know, he was a magician, but it turns out he was so good at everything else that nobody remembers him for being a magician. Now he's got a banjo album out, and it's adorable. Uh, the... <laughs> Uh, but but um, that's culture you don't find other places th right there. That's true. And so uh, you you end up in this place where there strangely there there are magicians who love to create magic. There are magicians who love to study magic. There are magicians who love to perform magic. There are comedians who love the fact that they can hang their careers on being magicians to get on stage. Uh, and then there's uh, uh, you know and there's uh, and then there's uh, whatever. There, there, there's a wide spectrum and and. Um, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but I do know that everyone has their own agenda. Some people want to be known for creating. Some want to be paid for showing up on time. Some want to be uh, uh, just famous or, or known for being funny, and magic is the vehicle to get you there, and it happens to be something they love. And then somewhere are magicians who believe that it is a, uh, a ladder and that because they've learned all these slights, they deserve to be higher on that ladder. Why is that guy on The Tonight Show? I'm so much better at my double lift than he is. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, it's a weird space. One magician, thank you. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, I, I don't know. That's the answer. Take that. Can you show me the double lift thing? Uh, yeah. yeah, you, uh, it, uh, it, you grab like this. There you go. And you, you unscrew, twi whatever. Um, just, there's, there's, yeah. a lot of, there's a lot of people that get into magic that don't go anywhere because they don't have charisma. It's not... That's the other thing is it's not for everybody. Um, and that's hard to explain. I've had guys come up to me and go, oh, I want to be a professional magician. And I, I, I tell people, here's the thing. I honestly believe this. My job as a professional magician is not to fool people. And I know that may sound weird, but my job is to entertain people. Some people walk away from my show going, holy crap, I have no idea how you did that. That was cool. Okay? So they, they just sat back for the ride, and they enjoyed the show. So I know with them I did my job. But I get somebody else who comes up after the show and go, now, on the thing where you were tied up, I think you da 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 and they'll give me their explanation, which I never say yes or no to any of that, because if I say, no, that's how I did it, no, that's how I did it, and they ask me another one, I go, oh, I'm not going to tell you about that. <laughs> um, so I never tell, but I, my, I know that if they took time and effort out of their day to analyze what I did, then they were entertained. I'm that type of person. When I see something, I want to figure it out. Okay, that's entertaining to me. Even when I'm not working, I guess I'm never working, but um, <laughs> even when I'm not doing magic, I'm playing board games or I'm working puzzles or Jeez. I'm doing different things where I think and I'm analyzing. That's entertaining to me. Um, I mean, I guess, I guess uh, sh short, answer, no. short answer is you're asking how much charisma matters. And, the, and to me, the difference is uh, charisma is absolutely essential if what you want to be is, is a successful onstage entertainer in the magic field. Having said that, there's big 
big, wide variety of places for people in magic. There are magic teachers, right. there are magic creators, there are magic technicians. There are, uh, you, you know what? You might be the kind of person who's great at solving puzzles, uh, uh, but but have no, nothing good with your fingers, in which case maybe maybe cryptography is where you belong, or, or, or mathematicians, or, you know, Martin Gardner was not known for being uh, uh, hilarious on stage, but he's one of the most important magicians who ever lived, you know? So, uh, does that answer your question? Yeah, perfect. All right, right on. <laughs> Clap yeah. for it, yeah! Hello, uh, I'm Christopher from Sarasota. And my uh, question is... Where's Sar where, where, Sarasota? Florida. Florida, Florida. Florida. Yeah. Florida. okay. This is right. down from here. I like the way you pointed at yeah. Florida in the there direction of hell. It's, <laughs> it's down there. It's hot, obviously. <laughs> Same thing, right? I don't know. You saw where all the old people are, so... Yeah, right, there. On, right on, right on. That's some, um, so what's going on, man? Yeah, so I do a little bit of magic, too. Excellent. And I was wondering... As for a, uh, oh, there you go. But with skeptics who like are out to get you, and they're like, oh, I know how you did that. Oh, that's a trick. They're like, want to ruin your performance? It's like good for you and not Hogwarts. But like, what do you do? Because I know some people just like try to ignore it. Some people have like witty one-liners ready. Like, what uh, what is your it's, take it's, on it, that? Uh, here's the thing, man. If a skeptic, it's hard for me to look you in the eye and say this, but it is. It was hard for me to realize it for myself. If a skeptic is busting you during your performance, it's your fault because you can't make them not an asshole. Uh, you can, however, frame your performance in such a way that he's boxed in. You can say things before it begins. Like, for example, I will never perform magic socially on some, unless somebody asks me a second time. The first time I say the words, um, you know, hey man, I'm a magician, oh, do some magic, which is so weird because it's the only profession where people do that. It's not like someone says, I'm an actuary, and I go, oh, do my taxes. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, 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 you there's, ask him again. Yeah. <laughs> There, there, there's something about magic that causes a knee-jerk reaction where people ask you to do a thing when they don't really mean it. So that's the first thing, is have proper filtering before you start performing. Second of all, set up the conditions to win. There's a fantastic book by Juan Tamariz uh, in the 1970s called The Magic Way, where he talks about canceling out methods. You know, he says, uh, 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 People are smart, and they're gonna think, well, maybe it's this, maybe it's that, maybe it's that. Your job is to block off all of those so that there's no answer. So likewise, do the same socially, and before you get to the end, when everybody's engaged, while you still have power, say things like, now, a skeptic asshole would say something like this. He can't say that now. <laughs> This one total jerk once said that. Well, I can't say that. He's like, but you know what? The handsomest, tallest, strongest man I ever met just shook my hand once this card was his. And then you do it, and then and now he's bound. It's like you, you control the situation, and, and, and you could create a scenario, uh, number one, by filtering, not putting yourself in a weak position. Number two, by setting up boundaries that make sure you end up as a winner. And, and it's, it's important to, to frame it right, because everybody goes about that differently. The way Brian does it in his show is different than how I do it in mine. Um, you know, it, you, may, you may get them all excited about what you're doing by being funny first, or do something totally out of nowhere that blows everybody's mind, and then, then you're a step ahead. And that's part of the charisma question, is find out how you do things, what's, what's your greatest strengths, and play to that when you, when you build your boundaries. Good question. Give him a hand. Thank yeah. You. Hi, I'm Heather. I'm from Atlanta. Um, right on. <laughs> uh, it's, it's interesting. He sort of touched on what I was going to say, but I go to as many magic shows as I can see as a skeptic, you know, so this is the first time I've ever been with a bunch of skeptics at a magic show. It's very interesting. Um, being at, like, Disney World or just, like, in the general public, it's it's a lot different. People want to believe, I think. And so how did, did you change the show at all, knowing that we were all going to be sitting there as skeptics? Ooh, that's a good question. That, that's a good question. <laughs> and the answer I might give might be different than you asked my wife. Um, you know, because that's what I told her. I said, you know, like, part of me goes, okay, people here in general think more for themselves and they're smarter than the general public. So I, we, we talked about that. I actually talked about that. said, how is that going to affect what I do in setting the boundaries? And I went, you know what? Bottom line, back to my other answer. If I'm entertaining, mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't want you to figure out the tricks. But again, that's not my job. I've got to get past that. If I'm worried about you learning every trick I've got, I'm not going to be a good entertainer. It's just not going to happen. So uh, in the end, uh, we went, you know what? I'm not going to change anything in the show. 
Um, hopefully they dig it. If they don't, then Derek's going to go, oh, that was a terrible idea. Don't ever let that guy come back, you know? Yeah, I mean, we came but, at, like, we probably come at it from a different angle, like, oh, I know that this is a trick. Well, I know partly, yeah. here's the other part. There are certain things we do that it's easier to perform for people that are intelligent because part of what we do is we take everything that you've learned about life through living life, mm -hmm. and then we try to create a, a reality that's not the case and overlap the two to make it hard to distinguish. Right. I did a birthday party one time back, I don't know, 85, something like that, and I made this little girl float, three years old, in the park, outside, no curtains, no wires, no anything. At the end of the show, I said, do you guys like the show? All the kids are like, that was great, that was awesome. I said, what did you think of the little girl floating? And one of the other little girls goes, that was stupid. <laughs> I said, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, what do, you, what do you mean? Like, that's the most expensive trick I got. Well, I was <laughs> stupid. And she said, you had a coloring book that colored itself. Like, I can't even stay in the lines. That's real magic. <laughs> I'm like, okay. I got that. I got that. But why is the girl floating stupid? She goes, well, I got a bird that walks around in my backyard. <laughs> so I'm like, now that, now what does that got to do with anything? She goes, well, I've seen the bird walk. And Jennifer, she can walk. The bird can fly. And you, she just floated for a couple seconds. That was stupid. <laughs> No idea. Nobody told her people can't fly. Yeah. Birds can fly. Birds can walk. People can fly. It just makes sense to her. So if I make somebody float, a reasonable adult goes, holy crap, people can't float. Yeah. Kids, they don't know that. Yep. So you get somebody that's really intelligent. You can push the envelope a little farther and sometimes even be more obvious when you do it because they're used to knowing this can't happen. So... Uh, you know, I just decided not to change so it. Great question, though, because I asked myself the same question before I showed up. Did you see the show? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Did you, do you like it? Yeah. Oh, come on. I, I, I appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, sir. sir. What's your name? Uh, Rob from L.A. Right uh, on. Brian, this is specifically for you. Uh, what's with your costume? Well, I'm a copy doctor. Why? Yeah, I'm here to fix the, uh, the, replace the pressure roller on your copier. <laughs> Yesterday, I was a mechanic. Why were you a mechanic? Just, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, man, that's a good question. It's almost like I'm cosplaying somebody you haven't seen yet. <laughs> the the, the, really right, the right answer for that? The right answer is go, dude, do you not watch BBC? Next question. That's a way. <laughs> <laughs> I did that yesterday. I was walking through. I, I had. I, I, wait, I, all I'm going to say is, like, uh, you know, if you took a picture with the copy doctor now, you might find it more interesting next year. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. <laughs> Oh, that's a hint. Now you got to watch Brian. you got to follow Brian online. See, he thinks these things out. That's hey. why he's got more Twitter followers than I do. Right there. Right there. That's why. Hey, I'm Brian. What's your name? Uh, hi, I'm Janelle. Janelle, I'm where are you Macon, from? Macon, Georgia. Uh, Georgia, right on. Where? Yeah, Macon. Oh, wait. Macon. You said, you said. Macon, you know, you know. Okay, got it. It's Performed in Macon ready times. Yeah. <laughs> um, anyway. Uh, he said hell. <laughs> Um, now I'm flabbergasted. Um, I watch a lot of TV, of course, figure that out. Um, and I watch like brain games and stuff like that yeah. on National Geographic. Great it's a great channel. Yeah. It's a great I love show. it. I really Whatever do. Whatever comes on after that show, it must be real good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Nat, Nat Geo is exactly, an amazing channel. Exactly, because I changed the channel. Um, <laughs> I really like that show. And then I watch other things. I don't know. It's fun. Anyway. Um, but they really get into the psychology of magic and what it what it does to your mind. Um, and how it tricks you. What do you guys do to us that tricks us, I guess? What I, do you guys... We can't tell you. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> uh, let me tell you what, man. I uh, Have any of you guys, like, done the homemade Google Cardboard Oculus VR type experience? Have you guys, have any of you guys done this? Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so the Oculus Rift is this incredible piece of hardware that uh, uh, takes a couple lenses and has some uh, uh, anamorphically shaped stuff, so you put, you, you put it on and you're in another world and it tracks and all this stuff. There's a company, uh, Google Cardboard, or Google announced their cardboard thing, which is a uh, uh, flat packaging, and it basically there was some kind of Google no Cardboard knockoff that I spent 30 minutes assembling myself. I'm the one who folded everything together. I'm the one who put the lenses in there. I'm the one who set my iPhone in it. I'm the one who loaded the simulation program, and I'm the one who was suddenly freaking standing on a goddamn spaceship uh, looking down on the planet Earth, okay? So the fact that I knew how every step of the whole thing came together in no way took away the magic or the wonder. Magic is in the gaps between what we feel like uh, and, and perceive and, and, and what is what 
there, between what we know and what we perceive. And uh, in that regard, I feel like magic is in every way possible, regardless of, of how much you know going into it. That's what I was going to say. Yeah, well, in, in how it directly relates, we have to ask ourselves the same thing. What, what do we have to do? How do people think? And what, like, there's different ways to do it. Sometimes you come up with a, a technique for something, you go, that should be a trick. Yeah. Uh, other times, um, you come up with, you go, you know, what would be a really cool trick if I could do this? And then you got to think about, well, how do people, how are people going to see that? And how can we get them to believe that that really happened? Uh, for those of you guys familiar with, with my stage show, uh, uh, EVP, where we make a ghost appear on everyone's cell phone, began with me reading uh, an, uh, an engineering article about how uh, uh, cell phone CCDs works and realizing that there is a way to exploit it. I was like, I wonder what I could do with that. Turned into a whole routine based around a, an exploit that was in a lot of phones. Uh, 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 the simpatico, the mind reading routine, what literally started with me saying, I better be funny to tell someone you're gonna put them in an isolation booth and then put a box over their head. Uh, and I'm like, I'm like, well, why is he in a box? And whose mind is he reading? And then, and then what came from, and then the last thing we thought of was like, oh wait, also, how do we do it? Uh, so so yeah. there, there's different things in that regard. Yep. Hey buddy, what's your name? Uh, Ed from Gainesville, Florida. Right on. Woo, down there. Down. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I've noticed a trend, or most skeptics that I talk to have some one or two blind spots where they're, they're skeptical about a whole bunch of things, but UFOs are real, Bigfoot is real, I'm lucky, whatever. What are your blind spots? If we knew that, we wouldn't have them. <laughs> no, I think I well, do have my blind spots. I just, I, 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 I I love reading about brain uh, uh, chemistry. There, there, there's books like Incognito or uh, Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman, where it's like I, I spent a whole year reading books like these, and the one thing that I was left with is a strong faith in the belief that I am a dumb, mushy uh, 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 orb of prejudices that I can't explain. Um, and and I, 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 in many ways, it's one of the most freeing things ever. But, but having said all of that, you know, um, I, you know, I, I have, uh, you know, politically, uh, I, I, I have a belief that in general, uh, free market competition is better than not free market competition, and that's a bias. That's a, don't don't clap for that. Uh, it's it's a, be, because I'm coming to it with a, with a pre-held belief that might be proven wrong, and statistically, in certain situations, seem to have been proven wrong. I mean, for example, it's difficult for me to reconcile my belief that, in general, competition is good with the fact that, that statistically speaking, Democratic presidents have outperformed uh, Republican presidents. Don't clap for that either, assholes. Fuck you. Uh, the, uh, uh, and and uh, we all have our own blind spots, and my guess is most of ours are political, uh, especially once you learn that statistically, we all tend to be whatever our parents were, uh, politically speaking. Speaking. So I would say that's probably mine. It's if I'm probably wrong about everything. Yeah, it, it's it's all you you see them so much clearly after you find them. Seriously, mm -hmm. um, a, a great question I like to ask people when you're talking skeptically about things. Um, I, I think we tend to believe that what we presently believe is right too much. Like we think we're more right than we are on things. Kind of back to the political thing, but there's not hardly an area in my life, if you took exactly what I believe now and 10 years ago, that they would be the same. So if I was wrong then, it's ridiculous to assume that I'm right now. Yeah, agreed. So um, yeah, we, we all have a lot of uh, holes and they, they pop up. It's we, not, it's I don't true. think it's- true, we all have a lot of holes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they I'm just out. pop up <laughs> in one particular area. All right, clap area. for this guy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm Lee Peachtree City, which is a suburb here of Atlanta. Oh, right on. Right. Yeah. Your and, neighbors. And we have 93 miles of golf cart pass. So <laughs> that's our claim to fame. Um, I want to thank you for being here on the skeptic track. Oh, thank you. I want to thank you know Randy for doing that. My question is, why don't the big headliner magicians, I mean, they could have put Edwards down the day he still walked on stage, or they could have put the. Uh, no, the, I, I disagree. I disagree. Pendulette? No, 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 yeah, pen, no, no. yeah pen. Uh, I mean, first of all, uh, you have bigger than the biggest headliners making concerted efforts to shut down John Edward, and it did virtually nothing. Uh, South Park is 10 times bigger <laughs> than all of Magic combined. Right. And they had an entire episode dedicated to in detail explaining the nature of cold reading, statistics to back everything up. It was done in an infectious, hilarious style. 
And at the end of the day, those who wanted to believe he was real still believe that he was real. Now, all of that is not to say that we shouldn't put out the right word, that, that, that we shouldn't tell the truth as we see it. However, um, acting like uh, uh, any one of us could just get around to squishing that bug, I think, is, I, I think our job is not to squish a bug. Our job is to build a dam and hold back a tide. Yeah. And, and specifically, Penn Jillette has referred to that. He's one of the biggest magicians out there, and he actually has talked about that. So it's not that none of them do. Uh, yeah, everybody's kind of got their own career, and they got to make their own decisions as to what causes they get behind. There's a million great causes, and not everybody's going to touch everyone. Great question, though. Hey, buddy, what's your name? Gary from Noonan, Georgia. Right on. And my question is, is do you ever see a trick from another magician and think, oh, gosh, i got to try and do something like that or do something better than that, like competition amongst it's yourselves? the opposite. I see. I hate, I hate <laughs> watching other magicians' acts because it's lose-lose. If I love it, I'm like, well, shit, I can't do that now. <laughs> and if I hate it, I'm like, well, shit, I wasted my time. <laughs> Uh, it's very difficult. Uh, um, uh, one of the best pieces of advice Teller ever gave me was have heroes outside of magic. He said, uh, uh, you can't have Penn and Tellers be your hero in man magic because there already is a Penn and Teller magic. However, there's not a Salvador Dali of magic. That slot's still open. So as a result, I, I try to find magical moments and try to cross them over. Uh, I, will, I, I will appreciate polished artifice from other magicians on its level, but artistically, it's agony for me to watch because I know that it's lose-lose. Either I'm going to love it or I'm going to hate it, and either way, I don't get to do it. And I'm the opposite. I, I, I love every magic show I see, regardless if they're good or not. One of the best close-up magicians I've ever seen, Brian and I saw at the Magic Castle together just you know, a couple months ago, yep. and it was absolutely amazing. Now, I've got no desire to do any trick that he did, but inspired me to want to be better at what I'm already doing. Um, but there are a lot of guys that do go out. I, I, had, I had a guy call, uh, message me on Facebook. He goes, dude, I, I, I just did my first show. You're my inspiration. Thank you so much. I'm like, oh, that's awesome. Cool. He goes, yeah, I did your such and such trick, and I, I memorized all the lines, <laughs> yeah. and the jokes hit just funny. And, hey, I did this one joke. It didn't go as good. How am I supposed to word that? I forgot exactly what you said. Yeah. And so here I want to encourage a guy, but at the same time, I, like, back to, you know, like, I'm not even that good, so why do you want to be me, you know? I mean, shoot higher. Um, everybody's got to do their own thing, and, and, and that's, that's another. Maybe it's peculiar to magic. Maybe it's not as peculiar to magic. But there's people out there who just, they see something and go, okay, I'm going to go do that. And that's, you know. And, and by the way, having said, uh, even though I said, like, like I, I, I hate being in professional creative mode and watching other magicians. I, I get switched off my brain. Like, when we went to the castle, yeah, it was, it was awesome. one of the most amazing, like, like, when I go as, 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 as a normie, I go all the way as a normie and, and, and love every minute of it. Uh, oh, Good question. Real, uh, wait, Thank you. Re real quick, real quick. Uh, there's a fantastic article. It was either in Genie or Magic Magazine, I want to say back in the early 90s, that either Penn or Teller wrote. And there was one line that stuck with me. He said, let hate, not love, be your guiding creative force. If you let love be your guiding creative force, then the best you will be is a pale imitation of the thing that you love. But if you let hate be your driving force, take ev don't, don't say what you love about magic. Take everything you hate about magicians and magic. What do you hate about going to the show? And then be the exact opposite of that. That formula almost guarantees that not only will it be something that you like, but that it'll be something brand new that's never been done before. Yes. Yeah. What was that too? How's it going? Hey, bud, Good. what's your name? Hey, I'm John. I'm originally from Parkersburg, West Virginia. Right on. Yep. Um, so, yeah, my, out of all kind of magic stuff, you know, my favorite's always the sideshow stuff because, you know, it's easy redneck humor. Hey, watch me do this, you know? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, and uh, it's, yeah. This exactly. is the guy for that. So, yeah. yeah. And what I'm saying is, accurate, the, by the way. <laughs> about every other exactly. time we're together, some conversation starts with Brian going, hey, watch this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> is it, it seems like, you know, all magic, one of the reasons that I think we, we have so much uh, respect for it here is because it all has such a huge learning curve for getting into a point from the point where you're, you know, just starting to the point where you're actually good at doing something, you know, and, but the sideshow ones, it seems like especially because it's like, okay, and if I screw this up, I'm going to seriously injure myself, you know. So how, how do you even, like, get started on that, you know? Hypothetically, by the way. 
Are you, are you asking, uh, well, it sounded like there was two questions. One is, is, is there a steep learning curve? And two, how do I get started? Or, or which one first? Yeah. Well, yeah. How, how, how would one get started? Oh, how do uh, get well, for me, it started yeah. with a couple of beers. Mm -hmm. And then uh, uh, the phrase, I'm pretty sure I can, dot, dot, dot. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, when, when, when I first started learning fire eating, uh, there was no definitive resource for it. Uh, there, there was uh, a, a book written in the 1960s by, uh, I don't know, Cle something, Cleason? Cle uh, Cletus? So, so whatever. Uh, but, but like, it had outrageously bad ideas. Like, here's a good gag. Take two bowls, tie them to some rope, put gasoline in the two of them, light them on fire, spin them around, <laughs> and, and the fire will stay in the bowls. <laughs> Uh, and then also, you know, uh, in uh, Miracle Mongers and Their Methods, Houdini's like, uh, well, if you want to swallow a flaming sword, all you got to do is first swallow a sheath of asbestos. Uh, and so, uh, because, it, I guess what I'm saying is I learned by trial and error. I don't recommend anyone else learn that way. <laughs> and so as a result, I wrote uh, The Professional's Guide to Fire Eating. It's like 180 pages long. And... Um, uh, you know, I consulted with uh, uh, chemists and, and fire marshals and, uh, uh, you know, and, uh, told what I knew about trial and error and put it out there. Um, I guess ult the best way is to learn under the tutelage of somebody uh, who's been doing it longer than you, right? So officially, officially, let me be clear that, um, uh, that the only way to learn fire eating or these stunts is under uh, a trained professional. However, having said that, you know, uh, I would imagine that if I were in the middle of nowhere, and I would imagine that if I'd read all the literature, and if I had imagined that I didn't have anyone to learn under, that I might, you know, with my own informed consent, try little versions of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Hypothetically. I, I, learned fire, I learned fire eating from Brian. So, I, that's, uh, but the other stuff, yeah, it's, it's, it really is the do not try this at home, like, the, the, the sideshow stunts really are dangerous. The driving a nail through the board. Whatever, driving a car is dangerous. That, that's true, it's true, but it, you know, it, it's kind of what risk tolerance do you have for yourself? Yeah. Hey guys, I'm Mark, I'm from Cleveland, Ohio. Right on. Um, yeah. Um, I'll clap for Cleveland. Thank you, right. someone. So <laughs> is this about LeBron James? No, okay. <laughs> It, we can make it about him. Anyway. Um, <laughs> we, we got three minutes. We can't. Yeah. No, quick question. Uh, what is the most useful skill you've learned doing magic in your careers um, that translates outside of the realm of magic? Communication. Communication. The you learn to communicate on stage. I was a very introverted person. Uh, I had no friends. Um, I grew up very, very, very much a loner. I was born uh, 10 weeks early. My mom would not let me play as a child. I couldn't climb trees, I couldn't ride bikes, I couldn't cross the street. When you're three, four, five, six years old, if you can't do those things, you make no friends. So by the time I was seven, eight years old, I was like, I have no friends, so why should I try to make friends? Because I'm not gonna have friends. So um, I was, but I started doing magic and I thought everybody loved magic, nobody liked me. And uh, I had a really inspiring moment. I was, uh, I, I was born in Grand Rapids, Michigan. I moved to Alabama. During that trip, our car broke down. We spent three days in Jellystone Park in Indiana. And uh, this big RV pulled up next to me. And these girls got out about my same age. And my dad's like, show me a magic trick. So I'm like, okay, so show me a magic trick. And oh, that's wonderful, cool, awesome, whatever. So that night, I'm outside. And the girls came up to me. And I'm like, I don't have any magic with me. Uh. And so we started talking. And by the end of the night, I was like, wait, they, they talked to me without any magic. And so I was like, okay, because they didn't know I didn't have any magic. So the next day at lunch, I'm sitting there, and they come over and talk to me again. Now, I have no idea what's going on. Um, and I, I, remember, I remember laying in the, the, the bed that night, looking at the ceiling and going, that was so weird. And I realized they don't know that I don't have friends. They don't know that I'm this introverted person. And maybe it's not the magic. Maybe they're interested in me. And it was just like, it completely changed the way I thought. And so I realized in Alabama, nobody knows who I am. So most magicians try to create a stage character that's an extension of themselves. And I did the exact opposite. When I got to Alabama, I decided that in day-to-day -day life, I would be who I am on stage. And I became instantly popular. And so uh, over time, I've just tried to make that, that stage persona, my day-to-day -day persona better. All right, I got 44 seconds here. Uh, I would say the most uh, valuable thing that I learned was uh, is the best skill you can have 
is being comfortable being uncomfortable. Stepping outside of your, 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 where you feel like you're uh, on top of things is the hardest and most important thing that you could do in your entire life. If you can, if you can get through having 900 people in West Virginia boo and actually throw fruit at your stage, you can get through anything. <laughs>